welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. 3D. It's a gimmick that keeps returning as brief fads for both movies and comic books. Uh, it's kind of a fun gimmick, and when I looked into potentially discussing 3D comics, I figured, you know, maybe I'll come across something silly that I can goof on. But instead, it took me down an unexpected path. It involved a revered comic creator, squabbles over rights, and perhaps most intriguingly, it bankrupted two separate comic book companies a generation apart. So today, let's talk about the history of 3D comics. And remember, when I tell you to put on your glasses at home, get ready for something exciting. 3D images date back to the 1850s in both Poland and France, and even appeared in film as early as the 1920s. The public fascination with 3D really took off in 1952 with the release of the action-adventure movie Buona Devil. Never before has the color camera captured such savage jungle violence as killer lions terrorize a fierce warrior tribe and a relentless white hunter challenges death itself for the love of his beautiful bride. 1953's House of Wax with Vincent Price was another big hit. In fact, between just 1952 and 1954, Hollywood released over 50 3D movies. And that did not go unnoticed by the comics industry. In fact, it was noticed by a highly respected artist, Joe Kubert. Kubert had broken into comics in the Golden Age, creating noteworthy work for what became DC Comics on titles like Hawkman. By the 1950s, he became the managing editor of a relatively new publisher, St. John Comics. Hubert worked alongside his former classmate and friend Norman Mahler, and they were paid royalties based on comics they successfully pitched to the publisher. In the summer of 1953, Hubert began talking to Norman about whether comics could be published in 3D. They called Norman's brother, Leonard, who had experience in printing, and worked up samples of Kubert's caveman character Tor and a Three Stooges strip to prove that it could be done in 3D. Publisher Archer St. John was impressed, and he quickly published Three Dimension Comics No. 1 with the Mighty Mouse license. It sold over one and a quarter million copies and was rushed back to reprints, ultimately selling over two and a half million copies. Thus began the 3D boom in comics, with Archer St. John renting out two additional floors of a warehouse to begin converting all of their comics to 3D. Kubert and Lohr filed for a patent on their process, which they termed 3D Illustereo. The DC Comics production manager at the time was a gentleman named Jack Adler. He was interviewed by Starlog magazine in 1987, and he spoke about the new 3D comics of the 1950s, saying, quote, I was working at DC, which was then known as National Periodicals, doing color separations for them. There were rumors in the industry that someone was toying with the idea of 3D for comics. Production chief Saul Harrison came over to me and asked if I had ever heard of such a thing, and could I do it? I said, yes, it could be done. And he said, do it. It was as simple as that. And with that, DC released a popular Superman comic done in 3D. They also made a Batman one, which I like, simply for the 3D glasses they included, which were cut into a bat symbol shape. Other publishers released 3D comics within 1953 as well, including Harvey Comics, who published Captain 3D, issue one by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby. But there was no second issue. Joe Kubert and Norman Mahler had hoped to license their 3D process to other comic book publishers. But, as the Superman example shows, other publishers just figured out their own way to make 3D comics. Within a year of publishing three-dimensional comics, over 50 comics from a variety of publishers had flooded the field of comics. And almost as quickly as it appeared, it all disappeared. Glasses on! Glasses off. St. John Publications had dismal sales in December of 1953, which caused them to back off on producing more of the expensive 3D books. And to add insult to injury, Kubert and Mahler were sued for patent infringement. They had unknowingly duplicated a system that was patented back in 1936. 
EC Comics publisher William Gaines had figured it out and licensed the old patent, which otherwise would have expired that year. EC Comics successfully published the gorgeous comics Three-Dimensional EC Classics and Three-Dimensional Tales from the Crypt of Terror in 1954. Kubert went back to drawing for DC Comics and founded the Joe Kubert School. Norman Mahler went back to producing films in Hollywood. And Archer St. John moved out of comics and focused on magazines. He would be dead from an alleged sleeping pill overdose within two years. The 3D comics of the 1950s were there and then they were gone almost as quickly. But if you can find them, it features some gorgeous artwork. You're talking Jack Kirby, Joe Kubert, uh, Kurt Swan on Superman, and of course over at EC Comics they had their usual stable of geniuses, guys like Wally Wood and Bernie Krigstein, and uh, also Glasses On! And now Glasses Off. Hey, I said Glasses Off. The early 1950s 3D comics fad came and went quickly. There were examples here and there over the next few decades, but nothing on any scale. Until the 1980s, when comic book publisher Blackthorn came in with licensed 3D comics all over the place. Transformers, Star Wars, the California Raisins? But where did Blackthorn come from? For that, we need to talk about the Shanes family. In 1971, older brother Steve Shanes and younger brother Bill Shanes founded a mail-order comics company they called Pacific Comics, based out of San Diego. Steve was 17 and Bill was only 13, but they had a lot of success by running ads in the Comics Buyer's Guide and later some Marvel comics. As the direct market grew, they began opening stores in 1974 and quickly got into distribution as well. The direct market, selling straight to comic stores, was just emerging and allowed for a wide variety of comics usually aimed at older readers. By 1979, Pacific Comics began publishing comics as well. An early success was luring Jack Kirby and publishing his title, Captain Victory. They also got Mike Grell to publish his book Star Slayer with them, which featured backup stories of a new character called The Rocketeer by Dave Stevens. In 1984, Steve wanted to test out 3D comics and hired Ray Zone to work in production. Ray had successfully converted some Jack Kirby art into 3D for Honeycomb Serial. However, organizational troubles led to delays on Star Slayer and Grell took his book to rival First Comics. In 2004, Shane spoke about how Pacific Comics collapsed in 1984, telling the San Diego reader, quote, most of our comic books still made money hand over fist, but there was a big problem in distribution. We extended too much credit to retailers who didn't pay us on a timely basis, and we were already working on a minuscule profit margin, maybe 5% to 8%. We didn't push hard enough to get the money from receivables who owed us hundreds of thousands of dollars. If you had to boil down our single biggest reason we blew it, that would be our poor cash management on the distribution side. Pacific Comics fell in 1984 and glasses on! Glasses off, glasses on! Oh, the Frenchman. Oh, monsieur. Glasses off. So, Pacific Comics went out of business, but Steve Shanes still wanted to stay in the industry, so he teamed up with his wife to open a new publisher, which was Blackthorn Publishing. In 1985, Steve Shanes and his wife Anne launched Blackthorn Publishing after raising $16,000, primarily from his credit cards. They started with reprints of comic strips like Sheena, but slowly grew. One thing Blackthorn did well was getting themselves into unique stores. In issue 108 of the Comics Journal from May of 1986, they mentioned Blackthorn becoming available in 7-Eleven convenience stores. Issue 54 of Comics Interview from January of 1988 has Shane's explaining their books were distributed to between 900 and 1200 specialty shops not covered by typical comics distribution. Places like Hallmark and Spencer's Gifts. But in the mid-80s, 3D made a return to movies. 
1982, we got Friday the 13th Part 3D, which featured a lot of scenes of folks holding ordinary objects close to the camera. In 1983, we got more horror sequels like Amityville 3D and Jaws 3D. That last one features laughable special effects like this moment in the finale, where the shark moves towards an underwater control room without being able to move, and it freezes in midair when it breaks the glass wall. Again, comics were fast to react to the 3D fad. In May of 1985, Blackthorn made their first 3D comic, a reprint of Jerry Iger's Sheena comic strip. It was a hit, and through 1989, Blackthorn published over 80 3D comics. Almost all of these were licensed properties, from things like Dick Tracy, to toy lines like G.I. Joe, to literally a popular advertisement. Apparently, The California Raisins was one of the biggest hits for Blackthorn. And I know that sounds crazy, since The California Raisins were originally stop-motion animation to literally promote raisins, but the public loved them, and they had an album that went platinum. Blackthorn specialized in licensing well-known properties, just like comic publishers like Dark Horse and IDW have done over the years. However, some of the best-known properties they were licensing, like G.I. Joe and Transformers, had comics coming out from Marvel at the time. The Blackthorn versions were not in the same continuity, and reading them could seem confusing to fans of the ongoing comics. And some of the licenses were a bit obscure, like an adaptation of the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Red Heat, but without the likeness rights. This is Arnold, and this is Jim Belushi. Blackthorn did attempt some color comics, but they weren't as successful, so eventually they put most of their efforts into their 3D comics. However, Blackthorn did diversify in an interesting way. They got into making prop comic books for Hollywood. For instance, the 1987 film Ruskies had characters played by Joaquin Phoenix and Peter Billingsley read a super gung-ho American comic book called Sergeant Slammer. Blackthorn produced the comic for the movie. A more prominent example of their work were comics about vampires seen in the movie The Lost Boys. Corey Feldman teaches Corey Haim about the rules of vampires by handing him some of the comics from the comic store he works at. Side note, I love seeing comic shops in movies, but listen to this bizarre dialogue. Look, you can't put the Superman number 77s with the 200s. They haven't even discovered Rec Kryptonite yet. Yeah, you shouldn't have issue 77 of Superman with issue 200 because comics go in chronological order. Kind of strange. Regardless, in 1987, 1988, Blackthorn was doing really well with its 3D comics and its Hollywood prop comics, but it all came crashing down within two years when they licensed a comic book that on paper sounds like it should have been a surefire hit, an adaptation of something by the King of Pop. In 1987, Michael Jackson released his album Bad. It sold over two million copies in its first week alone and now has gone platinum 11 times over. To help promote it, Jackson made the movie Moonwalker, which includes segments like the Smooth Criminal music video. Moonwalker was turned into a popular video game, and Blackthorn licensed it to become a comic book. <laughs> but they massively overpaid on the license, and it failed to sell well. More. There just wasn't enough of a crossover audience. Combined with that, the fact that in 1988, there was a black and white implosion in the comics market, which led to West Coast Comics distributor Sunrise Distribution declaring bankruptcy. Both Blackthorn and Fantagraphics sued to get money owed to them by the distributor, but were unsuccessful. The company was unable to weather that on top of the huge financial loss of Moonwalker and went out of business in 1990, over $180,000 in debt. Why were Michael Jackson fans uninterested in a Moonwalker comic book? I really couldn't say. Michael Jackson could sell just about anything at this point in time. Maybe it was the fact that in 1987, there was a 3D Captain EO comic book for Michael Jackson, and that was published by Eclipse Comics and available at Disney uh, theme parks. 
and it had been available for years. Maybe there just wasn't enough of an audience for two competing Michael Jackson 3D comics? Or maybe the audience was just burnt out on 3D comics by this point in time. It is a gimmick, ultimately. I gotta say, I enjoy a 3D comic now and then, but it does put strain on your eyes. At the same time, if that gimmick came out today, I am not gonna lie. I would probably be willing to buy a 3D comic now and then. Hopefully this was interesting. I never would have expected that 3D comics led to the demise of two publishers. St. John and Blackthorn absolutely invested super heavily in 3D. It did not last long and it led to both companies' demise. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, if you're still here, maybe you could do something like hit like and subscribe. You can at least consider that. It always helps the channel. And I'll see you next week with something interesting. Until then, keep reading comics. Hey folks, thanks so much for watching this episode. I really appreciate it. I thought I'd talk just off the cuff a little bit about some 3D stuff that I like. And uh, there have been a bunch of different 3D movies. We've gone through little fads and phases of liking 3D. Um, most of them aren't that dynamic or it doesn't really engage me that much. But there are a few examples of things I like. First of all, I will say Captain EO was really, really good. I remember that that 3D was pretty darn impressive and it was still showing at some Disney parks up until, I don't know, within the last 15 years. That was really well done. Um, had some good songs and stuff too. Uh, I really happen to like Friday the 13th 3D. It is not objectively a good movie, but it is entertaining. And I love that when you're watching it in non 3D, it's just constantly people putting things like baseball bats and popcorn and yo-yos right in your face. It's just constantly trying to use the 3D. And I'm like, yeah, if you're gonna do 3D, go ahead and do it. And I will say that the first Avatar movie by James Cameron, I remember really being impressed with the 3D at the time. It's not even really much of a favorite movie of mine personally, but I do remember that visually it was gorgeous and that there was some real depth to it. I hadn't seen 3D stuff in a while, so at the time it was kind of new. And at the same time, clearly people burn out on this. I'd be curious to hear from you. Do you have any favorite 3D comics or movies? Put it in the replies down below. I appreciate it. Thanks for watching. See you soon.